Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Lakeland Bible Church Sunday morning service for the 16th of August. I'd like to uh, open up our service with a uh, moment of prayer. If you'd bow your heads in prayer with me as I pray. Lord, we do thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for your love, and, and we thank you that you watch over us and that you care for us. And uh, while it seems that uh, all around us is chaos and tumult, uh, Lord, we know that you're in control. And Lord, we ask that uh, you provide peace to our hearts and uh, that today, this day, that we hear your word, Lord, that you open our hearts, you open our eyes and ears to the hearing of your word and the word of life and the gospel that will be preached today. And we look forward, Lord, to what you would have for us. We just ask that you bless us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Morning, church. Good morning. Everybody awake? I feel like, you know, I'm running for office or something. I got two microphones here. There's no fading? Wow, that's pretty cool. So anyway, I um, do want to start out the, the announcements today. Um, as a, there was uh, just an announcement that Pastor wanted me to uh, read out for you guys. So um, if you're watching this on Facebook, um, please let us know. Uh, in the comment section, we want to get an idea of folks that are out there that are watching. Uh, a recent Barna survey showed that since the churches have been closed due to the pandemic, many believers who watched in the beginning are no longer watching online. And Barna found that many have gotten so used to staying home on Sunday mornings, they may continue to stay home. Uh, please don't let that happen because of the pandemic. Like us, comment and share it with your friends. That's a simple way for you to spread the word. So just a reminder for folks, if you are watching online, that would be great if you go ahead and spread it. Uh, if you're not watching online, I guess you're not getting this message. Uh, so I don't know how that will work. But hopefully you're a friend of somebody that is watching online and you will get the message. Right? All here, that, anybody that is not here, can you raise your hand? Um, no, sorry. All right. Anyway, let's move on. Um, just want to make a few uh, quick announcements on the building. We, if, in case you haven't noticed, we do have a new light in the front that's lighting the driveway coming in. Our first attempt didn't work out so well, <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. But the second attempt, the, uh, the city has installed a light for us, and, um, and so now it's lit up very well. We do want to have you guys keep us in prayer for uh, also with building maintenance because one of our AC units did go out. You remember in the beginning of the year for folks that were here with the budget and I said well I'm worried about that one unit in the hallway that could affect a lot and sure enough yeah it did it, it did it. Uh, so we're looking into that right now so uh, we'll get that straightened out. Uh, just a reminder for men uh, we've got uh, men mentoring men on Tuesday uh, this Tuesday, uh, there's going to be a new study beginning. Uh, that's on at 7 p.m. It's uh, Jesus Among Secular Gods, The Counterculture Claims of Christ by Ravi Zacharias. So study guides are $13, and if you guys want uh, you know, to get a study guide, you can see Pastor Mike um, and, uh, and get, make arrangements that way. Um, also, just a reminder, on our Wednesday, do join Pastor in his uh, continued study in Proverbs. And, uh, and also with Facebook and YouTube, uh, just a reminder that we do have past vi video sermons out there, uh, especially in Facebook. I mean, I'm putting some really, you know, some of the, a lot of the older stuff that's out there. And if you go to the videos, you click on the videos link, you can see that it's broken by playlist. So I have it broken by books, you know, of the different studies. Uh, I almost got all of First John out there. I'm going to be working on Esther next. Um, we have Proverbs out there broken, uh, and then there, I think there's Acts that are out there. There's, there's a number of different, so if you guys are doing some uh, personal home study or something like that, uh, and you want to get more information about any of those uh, and see a sermon on that, that's a great resource. Um, and do share that with folks. Uh, would really appreciate that. Um, as far as giving, uh, continue, if you don't mind, uh, either give by mail. Lakeland Bible Church at P.O. Box uh, 7212, Lakeland, Florida, 33807. Uh, you can mail in your checks that way. Or you can also ha uh, do online giving with, a with cash apps at 863-209-2280. That's our 
church phone number. So you can use cash apps as another means of giving. I uh, do want to shout out a couple birthdays. We got Melissa and Carter on the same day on August 21st. So happy birthday, both Melissa and Carter. And I didn't see any anniversaries listed, so hopefully I didn't miss anything. So uh, anybody on that one. So with that, we'll get into the National Day of. So today is the National Tell-A-Joke Day. Do you want to hear a joke, a construction joke? Sorry, I'm still working on it. Still under construction. So. Okay. All right, yeah. All right, so there you go. Uh, it's National Roller Coaster Day. <laughs> this is why I don't quit my day job, right? This is, you know. All right, so National Roller Coaster Day. Uh, it's uh, on this day, the first ver vertical loop roller coaster was patented by Edwin Prescott in 1898. Worldwide, the oldest roller coasters believed have originated uh, from Russia in the 17th century. In the U.S., the earliest roller coaster designs patented in 1872 by J.G. Taylor. And the first one that uh, had opened was in Rocky Point, Rhode Island in 1872 as well. So there you go. There's your trivia for roller coasters. It's also National Airborne Day. It honors the military airborne divisions of the Armed Forces, August 16th, 1940, marks the date of the first official Army parachute jump at Fort Benning, Georgia. That was interesting. Currently, U.S. Army has two airborne divisions. Anybody knows them? And? Bingo, right. The 82nd Airborne out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, began as an infantry division and then the 101st Airborne, also known as the Screaming e Eagles, uh, out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So there you go. Um, and then if there's any pirates out there, it's National Rum Day. <laughs> Which I found was kind of interesting because the Royal Navy and the British sailors had received an allotment of rum all the way up to 1970. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. And those are your announcements. Who is that? Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Since it's National Joke Day, I didn't know that, but I thought I'd start off telling you a preacher story. Um, preacher came home one day, and he, he was kind of looking around the bedroom, and he found under a bed a, a shoebox. And out of curiosity, he just pulled the shoebox out. Inside the shoebox was a thousand dollars and three eggs. And so he's wondering, what's my wife doing with a shoebox with so much money and, and eggs hidden in it? And, and so his wife came home, and he brought the shoebox out. And he says, "Honey, I got to ask you, what, what's this all about?" He says, "You got a thousand dollars and and three eggs." And he says, "Why? Are you, what are you doing this for?" And she says, "Well, honey, she says we've been married thirty years." And, uh, and every time you preach a bad sermon, I, I put an egg in the box. And uh, so he says, okay, well, 30 years and three bad sermons, that's not bad. Well, what about the $1,000? And she says, well, every time I get a dozen, I sell them. <laughs> so anyway, that was one of my favorite preacher shows. <laughs> All right. Time to get serious. Um... For our prayer, I thought, opening prayer, I thought we'd just sing a chorus. Sing this chorus with me together, and, uh, and then we'll begin. This is our prayer for our morning time in the Word. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him. And say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Amen. 
Amen. Well, we're still looking at Peter's first sermon this morning. Two weeks ago, we began speaking about the primacy of preaching uh, for the church as we see that the very first ministry activity in the church was Peter's first sermon. And, uh, and so we concluded that Peter established a pattern, not only for his apostolic ministry, but also a pattern for the church and ministry beyond. And, uh, and also the pattern of preaching, but also a pattern for preaching. Uh, you will find that as you examine Peter's first sermon here, that it is biblical, it is theological, it is expositional, it is logical, and it is confrontational. By confrontational, I mean that it makes a case for the truth of the gospel by presenting evidence that, uh, that leads to an inescapable conclusion whereby the hearer has to ask this question, what do I need to do? What must I do? Whenever you hear a sermon, we are faced with truth and it requires us to respond in one way or another, upon which they are immediately told what to do to remedy their situation. And this is what preaching should be for us. It's the proclamation of a message from God that demands a response. And that response will lead to life transformation and eternal life if it is uh, believed and accepted uh, on faith or if you want to reject the message then uh, you will continue on your own self-centered independent path that will eventually lead to your judgment so preaching is primary it is the it is the God-ordained method to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ the Lord Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's what we all must do. It's not just the job of the preacher, although that is his primary responsibility, but all of us have some responsibility as far as speaking on behalf of God to a, a, an unsaved world. And so let's make note of that. When we looked at Peter's sermon, we looked at last week, we saw his introduction in verses 14 through 21. We said there are four parts to every sermon. John MacArthur makes note of this. There's first of all the introduction, then there is the body or, or the main theme, um, and then after that is a resp um, uh, an appeal, and after the appeal is a response. So those four things. Last week we looked at Peter's introduction, and, uh, and we find that in verses 14 through 21, and the very first thing he does is give a biblical explanation of what uh, what these people are seeing, and he goes back to the writings of Joel. Joel wrote eight, nine hundred years earlier, and he goes to Joel's prophecy, and it serves as an introduction to his sermon, which that was the hook. That was, that was what got their attention as he, as he pulled out the, 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 his knowledge of the scriptures, and he began to quote the prophet Joel, and he used that to explain what was happening there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So for his first sermon, God, God gave Peter this huge audience. People had come, and had come over from all over the place. They were in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate uh, the Feast of Pentecost. And, uh, and so they were all there, thousands of people. And then he gave him the most powerful introduction to any sermon that, that has ever been heard before uh, when the Holy Spirit came. Uh, there was the sound like a mighty rushing wind. There were flames of fire coming upon their heads. The disciples were all speaking in languages that they didn't know, and everybody else was hearing the wonderful works of God in their own language. So there was a lot of miraculous things happening that day. And people were amazed. They were wondering, what's going on here? And then there were others who were just mocking and said, oh, they're, they're drunk. But it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. So Peter is filled with the Spirit, and he stands up now, and God uses him to give an answer for the events that had just been witnessed by them. And so as Peter begins to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, in essence, what he is, very, he, what he is saying to the people is, thus says the Lord. And so this is not Peter that's speaking. This is God speaking through Peter, and he leads off by reminding them that Joel wrote about the last days, and he called it the day of the Lord. He told them that uh, what they uh, were, had witnessed was, uh, si were signs that they were entering into the Messianic age, called the last days or the day of the Lord. Um, 
And so Joel's prophecy, by what was happening on that day of Pentecost, they were beginning to witness the, the beginning of the day of the Lord. And uh, although all that Joel would write about was not be fulfilled, they were just seeing the beginning of the day of the Lord. The conclusion to draw from his introduction is that judgment is coming. There is hope, and this is what he says to them. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is a word of hope. That is a word of encouragement. Judgment is coming, but be assured that there is a way of escape. You can escape this day of judgment. How do you enter into the kingdom's Messiah, or the Messiah's kingdom? How can they escape the judgment to come? So by way of introduction, Peter has just declared through the exposition of a portion of Joel chapter 2 that God's wrath is coming at the end of the age and that what they've just witnessed by the coming of the Spirit was a sign that God has now got a plan into place. He, he is just starting it up to where judgment is going to come. The last days are set in motion. What he doesn't say is that the day of the Lord is not a literal day. It's a span of time. Now, Peter doesn't know when that span of time, how long that span of time is going to last. He is preaching now with a sense of urgency because he thinks that it could be any moment. And all preaching should be preached with a sense of urgency because we don't know the day or the hour when the Lord Jesus comes. But here Peter is doing it, and it's been 2,000 years. And, uh, and yet he still preaches with that sense of urgency. Make no mistake that judgment is coming and so the logical question is, if this is the Messianic age, then who is the Messiah? Which now brings us to the body or the theme of Peter's sermon as he introduces the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah whom they rejected um, by having him crucified. And so if you have your Bibles, you can look at Acts chapter 2 with me, and we're going to read through beginning in verse 22. And I want to read through to the end of the sermon in verse 40. And this is, uh, this is how Peter preached to them. He said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as, of the, Lord, as the Lord our God will call. 
And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. He begins here with the words, Men of Israel, hear these words. And remember we made the point last week that whenever a preacher gets up and he is preaching the word of God, if he is true to the word of God, then you as the audience need to pay attention. You need to heed what you hear because it is not the man in the pulpit who is speaking to you. It is God speaking through the man in the pulpit when he is filled by the spirit of God. So it's God who wants to speak to you through his word, through his servant. And, and so listen up, he's saying, because God has something to say. We're not here to give you my opinions or my thoughts or my ideas. What the preacher is resp responsible to do is to, to declare the word of the Lord to God's people. And so we need to keep that in mind. It is, G it is God's voice that you hear. And God uses spirit-filled men to speak to us about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Acts of the Holy Spirit is what we refer to as this book here. But there is one primary act that the Holy Spirit uh, fulfills, and that is to glorify Jesus. That is job number one for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is speaking, it is, it is Peter's aim to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And any pastor, any preacher who is standing in the pulpit to preach the word, when he is filled with the Spirit of God, that is what he is going to do. He is going to bring attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is my job to point you to Jesus. Not just for salvation, but for comfort and for strength and for direction and for wisdom and for answers and for hope. Because Jesus Christ is our all in all. When, when I engage in that relationship that I have with him, then whatever problem I face in life, whatever difficulty, whatever questions I may have, he's going to have the answer for me. I will find it in him. And so the Holy Spirit's number one responsibility is to exalt Jesus. Peter's purpose for this whole sermon was to make crystal clear to them who Jesus really is. He is God's anointed one, their Messiah whom they rejected. So in verses 22 through 20, 36, he gives the scriptural evidence for believing that this carpenter from Nazareth is indeed the Messiah of Israel. And so now he's going to launch into the the, the main body of his sermon, and this is what he wants to prove to them, that this Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah that Israel was expecting. And so, as he begins, he identifies five doctrines about the Lord. Remember I told you there, there are two words about preaching. One is kerygma, that means to declare or to herald, to proclaim. The other word, word is dedicate, which means to teach. We get our word didactic from so anytime there is the proclamation of the word, there is also contained in that proclamation the teaching of the word of God. And so what we find in any sermon that is, that is preached from the pulpit will also have doctrine. Doctrine is not a bad thing. It's not a bad word like many think. Doctrine is important for us. And, and Paul exhorts Timothy, or Titus rather, to, to teach those things that become sound doctrine. And so we need to keep that in mind. So, biblical preaching is doctrinal. So, the first thing I want you to look at is Peter's, Peter preaches Christ, verses 22 through 35. And the first doctrine that we find that he mentions is the incarnation. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Jesus is his earthly name. But it is the name upon which we all must call if we want to be saved. There is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. He will say that in his next sermon. The name Jesus literally means Jehovah saves. But with the name Jesus so common in those days, he had to identify the Jesus that he's talking about. Jesus the carpenter from Nazareth. Remember, the angel told Joseph to take Mary as his wife. And even though she was already pregnant and he wasn't the father, the angel came to Joseph and said, That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
This was the name by which they mocked him. Jesus the Nazarene. Even Nathaniel asked his brother Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? John MacArthur writes this of the name Jesus. It's, he says it reflects our Lord's wonderful condescension in leaving the glory of heaven to live in the humble Galilean visit, a village. This is a name that emphasizes his humanity and his deity. Jesus is his human name, but it also exemplifies the, the, the humility of his character as he comes from glory to become a man. God became a man, and we'll get more into depth in that as we make our way through the book of Acts, but the fact that Jesus was a man is essential to him being able to die in our place. He is our sinless substitute. I can't have an animal take my sin away from me. I had to have somebody who was capable of bearing my sin once for all time. And only Jesus could do that because he was sinless. Our sinless substitute. Only a sinless man could pay for my sin and yours. And because he had no sin of his own, he would qualify to pay for our sin. And so we see that in his humanity. He had no sin of his own to pay for. History confirms it. The Bible confirms it. And now Peter says God confirms it with his authentication. He was attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. I like the way the New Living Translation states it. It says, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by him doing things that only God can do. The Greek word attested also conveys the idea of offering proof. So Jesus of Nazareth was a man proven by God to be who he claimed to be by doing the things that he did. Those were the evidence, those were the proofs that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. You remember Nicodemus came to the Lord Jesus at night. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. And here was a Jewish leader who was honest enough to uh, admit the truth. His, uh, his compadres, his uh, fellow Pharisees and Sanhedrin, they accused Jesus of... Uh, casting out demons in the name of Satan. And then Jesus, he turned that around on him. He says, if, if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? They had heard him teach, and he taught like no man had ever done before. They saw him do incredible things, miracles, and they had even seen him raise people from the dead on multiple occasions. They had witnessed that. And so all these things that Jesus did during his earthly ministry gave evidence to the fact that he was Jesus the Messiah. So he was authenticated by God in the works that he did. Then thirdly, he gets to the point of his crucifixion. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Now, Notice here that he clearly reveals that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was part of God's plan. As far as the Jews were concerned, Jesus' death was evidence that he wasn't the Messiah. As a matter of fact, in Luke's Gospel, you read these words as Jesus was on the cross. It says, and the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen one of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. You see, they thought that his death actually invalidated the claim to be the Messiah, when in fact it validated it. 
Jesus was not killed because he was the victim of his enemies. He was killed because God had a predetermined plan before the world began. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 that he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10 says, but God was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. And so rather than invalidating the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, his death actually confirmed it, declaring that he was the fulfillment of God's eternal decree. And he makes it personal here when he says this. He says, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. He's saying, you did it. God planned it, but you're responsible. You're the ones that actually had him crucified. You cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate wanted to try to let him go. He's, he wanted to give him an out. But they wouldn't accept it, and they all cried out, crucify him. Even Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, and he wanted to release him. Stephen Cole makes an interesting observation, and he says that without violating their will, God used evil men to accomplish his eternal purpose. But those evil men were responsible for their crime. No one can blame God for his own sin. So keep that in mind here, that this was God's predetermined plan and purpose that Jesus Christ would be crucified, but the men who had him crucified are accountable. They are going to be held responsible for the sin of having Jesus Christ crucified. And he's going to nail this point again in his conclusion. And so we need to keep that in mind. Then he gets to the point of his resurrection. Whom God raised up, the New American Standard says, but God raised him up again. The claim that Jesus was raised from the dead is a, is a powerful dose of reality that would destroy their denial of who Jesus is. They had rejected Christ. They mocked him and they ridiculed him. They called for his crucifixion, so they were responsible for his death. And so the resurrection now becomes the highlight, the focal point of his sermon. After spending one verse on the life of, of Jesus and one verse on the death of Jesus, Peter now takes nine verses to talk about the resurrection. And with everything that has happened since the crucifixion, they could no longer deny that Jesus was alive. By now, not only had the disciples seen him alive, but hundreds had already seen him alive. And the word had spread out through all of Jerusalem, so now everybody had heard that Jesus was alive. Of course, that would have enraged the Jewish leaders, and they did everything that they possibly could to try to prove that he was dead, that he did not raise from the dead. They did everything they possibly could except produce the body, the one thing they couldn't do. All they had to do was uh, produce a body that would have shut this movement down. End the story. End of Christianity. If Jesus Christ were still dead. But they couldn't produce the body. If they could, then Jesus' death would have just become another tragic Roman execution of a good man. But they didn't because they couldn't. Because he was alive. John MacArthur writes this, he says, Without it, the resurrection, his death becomes a heroic death of a noble martyr, the pathetic death of a madman, or the execution of a fraud. The greatest proof that Jesus is the Messiah, then, is not in his teaching, his miracles, or even in his death. It is his resurrection. And the resurrection becomes the focal point, not only of the apostolic preaching, but it also becomes the climax of God's redemptive history. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel story. There is no good news. We have a, a living Savior. No other religion can make that claim. That's what distinguishes the Christian faith from all other faiths. That Jesus is alive. Twelve times it's preached in the book of Acts. In addition to Saul, when he was on the, on the road to Damascus, on his way to persecute more Christians, he had an encounter with the living Christ. And he was dramatically converted. And then he would later write, 
in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection is the proof of Jesus' messianic claim that he is the Son of God, God the Son. In fact, verse 24 says it was not possible that death could hold him for a couple of reasons. First of all, we need to understand that Jesus Christ had the divine power inherent in himself to raise himself up. Because he tells, he tells people, he says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up. He could have raised himself from the grave. Then secondly, it was because God promised to raise him up and he quotes the Psalms, he, quote, he quotes King David in the Psalms to prove it as the evidence. And then thirdly, because God had already determined that the Messiah would be raised from the dead and he would take the throne of his father David. And so it would have been impossible for Jesus to stay dead. Peter once again reveals his knowledge of the scriptures when he quotes from Psalm 16 and verses 8 through 11 to show that the resurrection was predicted by King David. King David wrote this psalm. David declares that God would not abandon his soul to Hades, which is just a reference to the grave. He would not let him stay and rot in the ground. He would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. And then Peter argues that this wasn't talking about David because that's what many Jews believed that that psalm was a reference to David, that somehow he would be raised and he would sit on his throne. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why when you go through the gospel accounts, you see that, that Mark or Matthew and Luke make it a point to trace the lineage of Jesus to a descendant, to be a descendant of King David. That he is a son of David. So David prophesied that God had promised to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And, uh, and so he says in verse 32, This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. And so the resurrection becomes the focal point of this sermon. As it will in all the other sermons that we find in the book of Acts. His life, his miracles, his death, and his resurrection all point to Jesus as the Messiah. And then thirdly, or last of all rather, there is his exaltation. In verses 33 through 35, therefore being highly exalted to the right hand of God. Now we studied his ascension a couple of weeks ago when we talked about what is Jesus doing today. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he has a ministry uh, and he is praying for us. He has a ministry of intercession. He is our advocate before the Father. And so Jesus Christ is right now exalted, seated at the right hand of his Father. And, uh, and that really seal, sealed the deal. The fact that he rose from the grave and then he ascended into heaven. He was raised and then lifted up to the highest position of honor and power. And on the day of Pentecost, Jesus' words concerning the coming of the Spirit were being fulfilled and everyone present at the temple it could plainly see the evidence of the outpouring of the Spirit because Jesus said, I need to go away because if I don't, then the Holy Spirit's not going to come. And so he was ascended to the Father. He was given this place of exaltation and then 40 days later, 50 days later rather, he would send his Son or send his Spirit to indwell the church or rather 10 days later. So, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is another testament to Jesus being the Messiah. And then, Peter quotes Psalm 110 in verse 1 to confirm again that this is about David. He says, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. In other words, God the Father said to God the Son, sit at my right hand. Till I make your enemies your footstool. The Apostle Paul would later write about this in Philippians chapter 2, and he would say this, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and given him 
the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, his earthly name, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, then finally, we come to the time to make a decision. What does this all mean? Peter makes an appeal here. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, nailing him to the wall. He's de- he, he died on the cross because you had him killed. You are responsible for his death. You had him crucified. And because of that, God has made him both Lord and Christ. Christ, Christ is simply the Greek word for Messiah. It means the anointed one, God's chosen one. And he says, therefore, he wants to contrast what God did for Jesus with what they did to him. To say whom you crucified is the Holy Spirit's indictment against them. They killed the one whom God exalted. When Pilate gave them an opportunity to let Jesus go, they yelled, crucify him. Pilate said, he responded, he said, okay, I'm innocent of his blood. They responded by saying, his blood be on us and our children. Little did they realize that that is exactly the case. That they were responsible for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And it was upon their head. And now they have come to realize that this is their great sin. They had killed the Messiah of God. They were responsible. And now they want to know what to do. We, we killed the Son of God. Now what do we do? And so that's where it comes to the results. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. That's conviction. The overwhelming power of the evidence from the testimonies, from the testimony in Scripture, and the power of a logical ar- ar- argument cut them to the heart leading to a desperate sense of need for deliverance. The reality is that before anybody can be saved, they must first of all be convicted of their sin. This crowd, some 3,000 people who would respond, all of a sudden they were, they were gripped by conviction. The Holy Spirit had caused them to realize that they were responsible for the execution and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. They realized that they themselves were complicit in the greatest of crimes against a holy God, and they remember that Peter reminded them that judgment is coming. He told them in in John chapter 16 and verse 8 that that the Holy Spirit is going to come and he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. MacArthur said that conviction is the key used by the Holy Spirit to open the heart to salvation. Conviction is really the first work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. And in their, in their conviction, when they are convicted of what they had done, their response is, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so again, biblical preaching is going to call people to respond. There is a call for, there is an appeal for a decision to be made. What can we do to escape condemnation for what we've done? 3,000 people here are asking this now. I'm sure there were more there, but 3,000 people actually responded in faith. But we'll see this conviction again and again, and as we go through the book of Acts, we'll build on that some more. But uh, people realized that they were condemned before a holy God in need of mercy. Now understand there's a difference between guilt and conviction. Guilt is really the product of our conscience. That is is this innate sense that we all have of right and wrong. And Satan will, will jump on that and he will use that guilt to beat you to death, to make you feel worthless and hopeless and 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 just use that to to ruin you, to condemn you, to fill you with a sense of shame and hopelessness. Conviction, however, is something that is stirred by the Holy Spirit. 
It convinces us that we need to come to a place of repentance, that I have sinned before a holy God, and, and conviction drives me to seek out the right response. What do I do? Guilt will just drive me to despair. Because there's no real solution for that, and Satan will use that to capitalize and, and, and just ruin you for it. Conviction is something that the Holy Spirit brings into us because he wants to open our eyes to see our need of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that God has a solution for this sin that you've become aware of. Conviction is supernatural when the Holy Spirit convinces us that we need to come to repentance and faith as we realize that God has the only solution for forgiveness and resolve for our sin. So Peter says this, what is the solution? Verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Literally, it means to change your mind, but it, it, has, it, it, it means so much more. It means to turn away in the opposite way, to turn around. You're going in one direction, seeking after your own life, your own will. And to repent means I'm going to turn my back on my old way of living, and I'm going to turn from sin and to God. I've changed my way of thinking about my sin and about the solution that God has for my sin that's found only in Jesus Christ. Some preachers have eliminated the need for repentance today and they'll say that all you need is faith. But we need to understand that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have true saving faith without repentance. You cannot place saving faith in Jesus Christ if you think you can just continue on in your sin. You must change your mind about it. You must turn away from it. And so repentance, some people will say that repentance is not required because they, they will say that repentance is a, is a work. But repentance is not a work. It is a response and it is something that God grants to us. Paul says in Romans that it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. When I'm faced with the conviction of my sin, I realize that the goodness of God has been expressed to me through the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that when I put my trust in him, then I find forgiveness and life. He says, turn and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Baptism, making a public profession of faith in Christ. We symbolize our faith by, G by being baptized. It's an act of faith that demonstrates that you have actually believed in the gospel. At first glance, as you read that, it seems to say that salvation is by baptism. And some preachers will actually insist that baptism is required for salvation. William McDonald points out that such an interpretation is impossible, and he gives us several reasons why baptism isn't necessary for salvation. It's repentance and faith. Baptism is how you respond to the faith that you've placed in Jesus Christ. You're demonstrating that you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, first of all, in dozens of New Testament passages, salvation is said to be by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with no mention of baptism. So when you take the whole of Scripture, if one verse kind of sticks out by itself and it seems to say something that's contradictory, contradictory to the rest of the passages that you find, then you need to seek, all right, you need to take the context and consider what's being said. Because there is a principal rule in Bible interpretation, and that is that Scripture does not contradict Scripture. So if this verse seems to indicate that I must be baptized to be saved, then I need to try to understand what is it really saying? Secondly, here's another one of the, the, the thief on the cross. He had the assurance of salvation apart from baptism. Then thirdly, the Savior never baptized anyone that we know of. And it's a strange omission of, if baptism is something that is required for salvation. And then last of all, 
he speaks of the Apostle Paul. He was thankful that he, was, that he baptized only a few of the Corinthian believers. Strange course of thankfulness if baptism has saving merit. It's also interesting that in Acts chapter 10, we see the first Gentiles becoming believers, and they receive the Holy Spirit actually before they're baptized. So baptism really has no saving merit. The phrase, for the remission of sins, can also be translated because of the remission of sins, because of the forgiveness of sins. So keep that in mind in, as far as interpretation. I want to make it clear because many people will say that you need to be baptized to be saved. But the truth is, is that you don't get baptized to be saved. You get baptized because you are saved. You are testifying publicly that I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I want to align my life with him from now on. You're making that public statement. Peter goes on to say here, For the promise is to you and to your children. This refers to the Jews and their descendants. Salvation is a promise from God, and Paul says in Romans, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Salvation is a promise when they receive Christ through repentance and faith. Then he says, and to all who are far off, which would be a reference to the Gentiles. Although they didn't realize it right now. They didn't, they didn't understand that Gentiles were going to be a, included in this thing called the church. They wouldn't come to know that until they get, we get to chapter 10. And then, of course, we see the first church council in chapter 15, where that becomes an issue to be resolved within the church, where it is acknowledged that Gentiles are also included in the church and that they don't need to be circumcised to be a part of God's covenant people. And then he says, as many as the Lord our God will call. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, it says. But salvation is also the result of God calling us. On the one hand, salvation requires that a person call on the name of the Lord. But we also see that no one calls on the Lord unless and until God calls him. We are called. That's, that's another doctrine that we call the doctrine of election. God chose us. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Why did God choose me? I'm no better than anybody else. That's what grace is all about. I don't understand it. I don't understand why he chose me and not somebody else. That's just something that, that I'm going to have to be content with until I get to glory. And, uh, and then God will make it all clear then. But it makes me so grateful that he did call me. Because if he hadn't called me, I wouldn't believe. I cannot believe until he calls. Who's the elect? I don't know. I just preach the gospel. And, uh, and if you're called, then you will call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And that's for God to sort out. Peter preached some more. But all we have recorded here is, is that he said, be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41 tells us the miraculous response. Then those gladly received his word were baptized, and that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. <laughs> you know, I don't think preaching gets any better than that. In one fell swoop of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, bam, we've got a megachurch. 3,000 people. We get to chapter 3, we're going to see 5,000 more joining the church. The Holy Spirit was busy and active. Next time, though, before we get to chapter 3, we're, gonna, we're going to look at the things that the church did, this new infant church, what they were like, what were their priorities. Because we can learn from them. As a church in the 21st century, we need to look to the example of the first century church to find out what kinds of things we should be doing. 
Because as I mentioned earlier, the pattern has been set. The example is there for us to follow. And so God reveals in his word what the church is to be and how they should function. And so we'll look at that in the end of chapter 2 next week and see what we can learn from this church. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we want to thank you that through the foolishness of preaching, you change lives and save souls. When your word is declared in the power of the Spirit, it, it is powerful and convicting and it calls us to faith and obedience. And still within us, Lord, a sense of urgency, a sense of need for the preaching of your word. Because, Lord, we live in a day now where it says that people don't want to hear the truth anymore. They would rather hear feel-good sermons than truth from your word. Father, I pray that your truth would continue to be proclaimed at Lakeland Bible Church, but throughout your church, in this country, and throughout the world, that souls may be saved and added to your church. And we pray these things together in Jesus' name. Well, that's it for the word today, and I trust that God has spoken to your heart. This is God's word, and he's speaking to us today. For those of you that are watching on Facebook, we're glad you joined us today, and I trust that the word uh, has encouraged you and convinced you of who Jesus Christ is. And if you don't know him, then call on him today. He's speaking to you now and would love for you to call on the name of the Lord. And uh, for all my friends at Lakeland Bible Church, Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to the day when we can all be together again. I'm anxiously awaiting, as many of us are here today. So, uh, God bless you. We are dismissed. Goodbye.